all industries being, for example, confronted with digitalization, which means the necessity to build up knowledge in a new field and to bring in competencies they have not used before, for example, in this case, digital technologies, um, there is a, a resource case for ecosystems. And since I believe that almost all industries are being disrupted or touched by digitalization, of course, there's a huge potential for, for ecosystems. Regardless the the size and the power of the of the individual companies being involved in the business ecosystem, they are all equally important, and they are equally dependent on each other, which is a completely different way of thinking. And I think many corporates have a, a big problem with that. To understand that in a business ecosystem, they are not much more important than the the small company or the small startup having whatever three employees. It is a change of mindset in terms of not looking at the own company anymore, but thinking in an ecosystem, thinking about different players. So it's not about how can I create something based on the resources I'm having. The question is, what might be a customer demand that would be interesting to address? And what are the partners I need for that? Welcome to this next episode of the Sparker podcast. It was my pleasure to talk to Dr. Bernard Lingens from the Institute of Technology Management and the Helvetia Innovation Lab at University St. Gallen, which is one of the leading business and management schools in Switzerland. We talked about why ecosystems matter for innovation and for creating your next business opportunities. It was a far-ranging conversation about strengths and weaknesses of ecosystems, the risks and opportunities involved, but also how you as organizations can tap into the potential of ecosystems. This is the Sparker Podcast. My name is Christian Lundsgaard, and as always, I wish you many insights while listening to this new episode. Bernard, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here at the University of St. Gallen to talk about ecosystems. Um, the listeners of that podcast, um, of course, have heard that buzzword many times. Uh, everybody is talking about ecosystems, especially in the fields of innovation and startups. And it is very interesting for me now to talk to you, who has a, like, a more theoretical and research perspective on uh, that topic of ecosystems. And first question would be, uh, why do you think uh, did this term or this idea of ecosystem had such momentum in recent years? I think there are two major reasons. And the first reason is because of the word per se, which is because it's a buzzword. So many people talk about ecosystems. I mean, I mean everything starting from collaborations, um, partnerships, maybe even environments, up to what we understand as a business ecosystem. So it's a very broad term that yeah, also stems from, from related fields or from different fields such as ecology, for example. And I think on the other hand, of course, and this is why we are here, there's also a content behind it. <laughs> and um, the reason why ecosystems as a content is so interesting is, I think, for several reasons. First of all, um, it is because digital technologies being an enabler for, uh, for business ecosystems because according to management theory, such thing as an ecosystem should not exist because the idea is to conduct business together and to produce a value proposition for the customer together. And of course, if you do that, you always have transaction costs because um, the, the, the connection of the partners, the knowledge and information exchange is always related with transaction costs. And of course, it would be more efficient to, to produce a product and to develop a product in-house, totally in-house, and doing it in collaboration. And modern information communication technologies, they make it easier for companies to reduce these transaction costs and to improve the information exchange among uh, partners involved. So we could say that uh, these ICT technologies definitely are an enabler for ecosystems on the one hand. On the other hand, digital technologies are also a driving force behind the development of ecosystems because I think most of all because industry convergence. So let's, um, let's take the car industry. 
a car manufacturer is has a lot of knowledge about how to how to engineer an engine, how to they know everything about wheels, about tires, and what they don't know is of course the digital component of a car, which is gaining a lot of significance today. So right now, of course, if you look at um, autonomous cars or self-driving cars, and also of of the connectivity customers are demanding in a car. This is something many car manufacturers are not familiar with. So they have two choices, either to build up everything in-house or to do it together with partners. So this industry convergence being driven by digitalization is definitely is a, also a driver of ecosystems for that reason. Okay. And um, you already gave a hint of how you are looking at ecosystems and how you would define it. Um, since that term is used so broadly nowadays. It's sometimes a bit difficult to uh, get an understanding of what people are actually talking about. Um, how um, or what kind of definitions uh, do you see out there in the field? Uh, and how would you define ecosystem yourself? What kind of different types of ecosystems are there? How would you define them? Yeah, um, I think the term that is that I typically here is ecosystem yeah, in terms of, of a community or a partnership of, of, of companies. And in research, this is what you typically call a knowledge ecosystem. So for example, if you have a startup hub or if you have a regional cluster, it involves um, maybe local authorities, it involves universities, it involves startups, it involves companies. And the main purpose behind this is knowledge exchange. It's not so much about producing something or learning or, or, or yeah, creating a novel product, it is mostly about having some exchange. And so this is what you typically call a knowledge ecosystem. And on the other hand, when people use the term ecosystem, they often talk about the ecosystem surrounding a technological platform, such as Amazon. So you also have Amazon in the middle, and then you have many um, shops offering their, their products on Amazon, on the Amazon platform. And then these players surrounding the platform, yeah, they are the also called ecosystem players, and, but then it's an ecosystem surrounding a technological platform. And a third term is the term that we are referring to, which is a business ecosystem, which is much narrower than these um, terms mentioned before. So a business, eco business ecosystem is aiming to produce a... Um, value pr proposition for the customer. So the idea is that you have typically around three to 10 companies or partners, and they are developing and producing a product or a service or novel business model together in close collaboration. So the idea of a business ecosystem is always to have a product that you can give to a, to a customer and then of course to earn money. So it's quite of a narrow term, always earning at, at a value proposition. And yeah, I think in terms of, of knowledge ecosystem, maybe one nice example, and then you're more familiar with this, is the Swiss FinTech Award, for example. But I think you also have a, an exchange platform among different players. Absolutely, yeah. The, um, uh, the Swiss FinTech Awards, they mainly have the, um, the goal to, uh, first and foremost, like foster and promote innovation and finance in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. But we don't do that in a sense of that we produce uh, a new product or that we produce a startup or, or a service, but that we uh, enable the uh, flow of information, the flow of expertise, that we create the, um, the, the connections to build uh, uh, business relationships between startups and banks. So I think it might be a mix between knowledge ecosystem and business ecosystem, uh, since we also have a very strong uh, um, take on to promote business uh, in, in the field of fintech, so that might be a mix of it. Um, from all those different categories, would you say that they are, they are like common attributes? Uh, are there like hard facts that you say, or do you have a checklist where you say, okay, I need to see those kind of things to, for, a, for a system to qualify as ecosystem, yeah. be it size or be it different kind of actors playing together in an ecosystem? Is there something like that? Yeah at least when it comes to a business ecosystem. So it has two, ma 
two major characteristics. The one thing is the value proposition, as mentioned before, because this is what distinguishes a business ecosystem from the knowledge ecosystem. Um, it is about the product that you're giving or that you're producing, that you're delivering to your customer. And the other aspect is the multilateral partnership. It sounds a bit academic, but the idea behind this is that if you want to make sure that all partners together are creating a value proposition that is, in the best case, more than just the sum of the individual contributions, what you need is an alignment. These players, they, they need to work together and they need to align themselves with each other in order to really produce a value proposition that goes beyond just um, delivering something to a focal player who is assembling everything and then giving it to, um, to the customer. And this form of alignment, of multilateral alignment that all the partners or most of the partners are mutually connected with each other is exactly the most interesting aspect about business ecosystem and maybe the, the strongest this, um, or the strongest aspect that distinguishes business ecosystems from related concepts. Because if all of these partners are aligned together and they create a value proposition that goes beyond the, the individual contributions, of course, it allows companies to create a competitive advantage or to create superior products and, of course, also to, to gain additional revenues on the one hand. On the downside, you also have the problem that this alignment and dependency of the partners, mutual dependency, imposes a certain risk on the ecosystem. And it also creates a situation in which it's not that important anymore how strong you are, but the, because the ecosystem is only as strong as the weakest partner, because all of them are mutually dependent on each other. So it is a completely different way of thinking. It is a completely different risk than doing things in isolation. And in the end, of course, it significantly changes the way of doing business, because competition, you cannot think about competition in terms of competition um, among single firms, you can think about competition in terms of ecosystem. As mentioned before, you don't need to attack the strongest company in the ecosystem. You can attack the weakest company, maybe a startup. You can buy the startup and then the ecosystem breaks down because of the mutual dependency. Mm -hmm. Or for example, when it comes to, to market entry, normally you would search for a, a market where you have a, a tra market attractiveness on the one hand, but also not so many strong players on the other hand. So it's easier to enter. From an ecosystem perspective, you think completely differently. You say, no, there are no players in this field, so it's not relevant for me. What I'm searching for is an attractive field, in which you have very strong players, so you can try to, to, to start a partnership. So these are just a few examples, but it, it shows that this multilateral dependency and interplay of partners and the superior value proposition the ecosystem is aiming to totally changes the way of, of thinking about business. And this is exactly why it's so interesting for us to conduct research in this field. Mm -hmm. um, to me, as, a, um, as an outside um, person to, to the research part of ecosystems, uh, what you just described now sounds to me like um, ecosyst the business ecosystem has similarities with the traditional value chain. Mm -hmm. um, how would you compare those two concepts, ecosystem mm -hmm. and value chain? Mm -hmm. Also based on the two characteristics I was just describing. The first, the value proposition. In the value chain, the idea is that one partner or one company is delivering to another company. This company is assembling different components and then creating a product for the next step in the value chain. So the final result, the final value proposition to the end customer, for example, in the car industry, the car PC, this is just... just <laughs> an assembly of the individual contributions of all players. The idea of an ecosystem, however, is to create a value proposition that goes beyond these single contributions. It's a, it's a delta. One plus one is not two, but three. That should be the idea of an ecosystem in terms of value proposition. And the other aspect is the multilateral connection and interplay among the players. Mm -hmm. Because in a value chain, you always have a bilateral um, step or a bilateral um, relationship among the partners. Because one step of the value chain is delivering to the next step and so on. So you can analyze the whole value chain by just looking at single connections between the companies. 
in an ecosystem, since all players are collaborating and they are connected with each other in a multilateral way, you can only analyze the ecosystem by looking at the whole ecosystem and not just by breaking down to single um, connections. And this is a definition aspect, but now you can translate this into, into business reality. And then of, it's, it's very obvious that this imposes a much higher risk. It also imposes a much higher effort of orchestrating that ecosystem because of these multilateral relationships than in a supply chain. So, and this is also a key defining aspect of an ecosystem because you need that alignment. You have a central orchestrator that is making sure that the partners are being aligned to that um, value proposition of the ecosystem and that is making sure that the ecosystem is running smoothly, which you do not necessarily need in a value chain because there the players can orchestrate themselves or they can just orchestrate their, their individual or respective um, suppliers and their customer. So it's a completely different way of managing. I found that was very interesting to, to put those two in a direct contrast. I think that was very helpful because it also highlighted the importance of alignment again, of, um, yeah, of aligning all these uh, partners. And um, uh, metaphorically speaking, uh, when we look at um, music, um, the, the idea of that high alignment or lots of alignment is needed. Uh, to me, it sounds like there needs to be a conductor, um, like in a classical music orchestra, um, that tells everybody how to, to move, when to start with the music, and they all have their notes in front of them that uh, show how the music has to, to work so that everything comes together just fine. And on the other hand, for example, you could imagine a a jazz trio or an improvisational band. In jazz, they usually don't have a conductor. They don't have a conductor. Usually, they don't play with notes. Mm -hmm. And in when I compare those two, I would say uh, the orchestra. I would connect them more with um, executing existing ideas or um, yeah, playing an existing piece of music just perfectly. Um, remaining like um, obedient to the rules, obedient to the written music that they have in front of them. While in jazz, it's much more about improvisation and innovation, one could also say. Uh, when, let's say, the pianist makes a mistake, uh, that won't be punished, but the band adopts and uh, makes that mistake, in quotes, uh, a new motto, a new motif in the music. And um, how would you um, position the ecosystem in those two metaphors? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that an ecosystem can be both. Because what you're mentioning are the two main, I mean, the protagonist and the antagonist of innovation management, which is exploration and aiming to novel business models, novel products, mm -hmm. and exploitation, aiming to making money with existing products or business models. And what we can see in our research is that you can use ecosystems for both fields. So there are ecosystems aiming at understanding and um, learning, and then finally creating an, a, an innovative solution that maybe is far away from the core business of the company. And on the other hand, you can also use ecosystems to exploit an existing technology or ex existing product jointly with the partners. And what you can also see, and this is, a, this is why the metaphor of the orchestra is quite nice, in, in ecosystems that are aiming to, to or at um, exploration, you typically have a smaller group of companies. And as you said, they don't have this strong orchestrator in the middle forcing them to do something because they remain quite flexible. Um, they have a few partners that are interchanging or exchanging their, their knowledge and the, especially the novel knowledge they've gained um, before. And then they are quite flexible and they can just try out a, a specific value proposition, see whether it works, and if it doesn't work, it, they stop it, they start with, with something new. And this is very nice for exploring business models and value propositions, but of course it's not that efficient because you're lacking the focal orchestrator making aligning the whole ecosystem to this one value proposition. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what you then have in, in different ecosystems aiming 
at exploitation, where you had typically have a stronger orchestrator in the middle, where you typically have more companies being involved. And then you can use the, the resources of these companies. Very, very often you also have big corporates um, involved in these ecosystems. You can use their resources to exploit quickly. And you can especially you can use the complementary resources of these partners to, to exploit more, fa uh, more fa uh, faster or um, yeah, also with a different resource base and um, complementing knowledge and, and resources. So an ecosystem can be both. Uh, that's very, um, very helpful that you bring up this distinction between exploration and exploitation. Um, I would like to come back to that a little later. Um, what I also saw preparing for, for that conversation is that you also have an academic background in mechanical engineering. And again, I'm going to the metaphors. Uh, I love metaphors. Um, <laughs> um, uh, would you say that you um, can draw some, uh, let's say, comparisons between what you've learned as a mechanical engineer with uh, machines, how they operate, and the properties of ecosystems? Yeah, because um, in a machine, you have different parts and also different gears that are working together. And they need to be constructed in, a, in an efficient way, in a way that they can work together and that the gears are, yeah, are being connected with each other properly. And the very same aspect you have in a business ecosystem as well, because it is all about aligning these partners and making sure that the whole ecosystem is running smoothly. And in a, in a machine... Of course, the gears, the gears have a different size. You have very strong and very big gears, but you also have very small gears. And they are equally important because even if you take the smallest gear out of it, out of the machine, it will stop working. And it's the very same thing in a business ecosystem because if you take maybe even this, the weakest player out of this machine, out of this ecosystem, it will stop working as well. So regardless the the size and the power of the of the individual companies being involved in the business ecosystem they are all equally important and they are equally dependent on each other which is a completely different way of thinking and i think many corporates have a, a big problem with that to understand that in a business ecosystem they are not much more important than the the small company or the small startup having whatever three employees but i think there are some limitations of this metaphor because in a machine, the, the individual parts are quite dumb. They're just doing their job as they're being told. And in a business ecosystem, it is a bit maybe a bit more like nature because these players, they are not dumb gears or dumb parts of a machine. They are companies with their own agenda, with their own ideas, with their own strategies. And this makes an ecosystem being quite, to some extent, quite unstable because it might be that you have a stable situation right now and the players are running or are collaborating properly, but then maybe the individual agenda of one partner might change or maybe um, the shareholder structure is changing. And then all of a sudden, these players are not working together anymore. Like in a natural ecosystem where a player, maybe a species of, of animals might go extinct or might leave the ecosystem. And then it's also breaking together and needs um, a change and maybe also a phase in which uh, there's a rebirth of the ecosystem. So to some extent, it is like a machine, but to the other extent, it's also very much like nature. What I find really interesting here is that um, ecosystem has its, as a term, has its roots in let's say, biology and, uh, and therewith is more correlated to organic systems. At least that's the case for, uh, in, my, in my head. Um, in, in nature, you don't have this idea of, of a designing agent mm -hmm. that, um, that is needed to align all the parts of the ecosystem. So that's maybe um, the strength of the machine metaphor, yeah. that you need an intelligent designer who created this whole thing mm -hmm. so that all the parts work together. But at the same time, as you said, the machine metaphor lacks the, uh, the concept of all these parts have their own will yeah. and that makes it all far more complex. Exactly. And um, uh, what I would uh, just would like to take this a little bit 
further and see where it goes. Um, the obviously, the machine was this main leading metaphor during the Industrial Age. And in the Industrial Age, you also had the assembly line that I would say could resemble the, the value chain a little bit or the supply chain. You have just one uh, piece after the other, one player after the other. And on the other hand, the, um, the metaphor of the organic ecosystem, I would say, is uh, is a better fit for the digital age, for the age of um, value creation through knowledge, through creativity, because everything is influencing everything, this interdependence. Um, would you like agree with that um, opinion that the uh, ecosystem is just a better metaphor for the digital age or for the um, knowledge economy and creative economy? To some extent, yes, um, especially because, um, as stated at the beginning, digital technologies are an enabler but also a driver of the rise of the ecosystem, or of the business ecosystem. But on the other hand, what we should not forget, and I think this is the, one of the major aspects, uh, one of the most important aspects as well of business ecosystems, is that in nature, as you, as you said, you, do, you don't have this orchestrator. And even if one... Yeah, or even if there are changes, the, there can be a renewal, and which is which is very nice, and it also matches nicely to a business ecosystem. But in a business ecosystem, you still have this strong alignment to a focal value proposition, which is the core aspect. And for this, you need this alignment being done by an orchestrator, and this creates the mutual dependency of the players, like in a machine. So um, they are both parts. On the one hand, this mechanical aspect of being aligned on something, on an outcome, and therefore being very dependent on each other. But on the other hand, also this aspect of the own willingness of the players involved. And so you have both. And I think it's, it's very difficult to say it's just one aspect, because as mentioned before, I like the, the organic metaphor because of, it shows the, the, yeah, the own will of the players involved and therefore also the difficulty to predict their their actions and their agendas. But on the other hand, the most important aspect of the business ecosystem that is also massively distinguishing the ecosystem from knowledge ecosystems, or the business ecosystem from knowledge ecosystems, is this interdependency and this um, necessity to align the players. And this is, as mentioned before, changing the way of thinking and the way of doing business. That's very interesting. Um, uh, in just a moment, I would like to um, leave the, um, the clouds and the, the level of abstraction uh, and go to a more practical um, uh, niveau. But first, one question came to my mind and it's burning. Uh, I want to ask it. And it's, we have talked about this conductor or orchestrator comes up all the time. What makes a great orchestrator? Do you have maybe first learnings from your research or a personal opinion, observation on what makes a great conductor and orchestrator of a thriving business ecosystem? That's a very interesting question. And out of our research, we have some insights, but they're not very valid at this point. So I can only state some assumptions and some hypotheses. So what we see is surprisingly very often um, the orchestrators of an ecosystem are startups. Normally you would expect the orchestrator to be a, a big corporate with all the credibility, with a large customer base, with the resources that, um, that come with a big uh, corporate. But yeah, as mentioned before, surprisingly, very often you can find startups in this role. And I think the reason is exactly what you're saying, because in a startup very often you have Younger people being well-educated, they speak several languages, which is important, especially in multilateral or um, uh, multilingual and multi uh, international ecosystems. Um, you have a more dynamic culture. You have higher flexibility. People are not being restricted, for, for instance, by contracts or by maximum working hours or by strict working times. And also, and I think this is a major aspect Startups are considered neutral because very often 
the big corporates, of course, they, ha they have their own history and they have their connections and yeah, everyone expects them maybe even to, to take a site in an ecosystem because maybe they have done collaborations before. But a startup is neutral, it's new. And so it's considered a neutral player within the ecosystem that is orchestrating and that is having the interest of all players in mind, mutually. Uh, I'm happy that you bring that up because that came to my mind as well. Again, with the background of um, me organizing the Swiss FinTech Awards, I would say that has been a crucial aspect of these awards becoming uh, like a real part of the Swiss fintech scene. That um, it was organized out from a startup that didn't have, um, let's say, if it would have been one of the big banks, by, by definition it would have been much, much harder for the other big banks to join uh, the initiatives. Mm -hmm. This um, uh, small size, this neutrality, this being a new player, I think was key to, um, to getting this role and the respect for being the orchestrator because of the trust, uh, because of, uh, I think, the actors or the members of the ecosystem didn't expect a hidden agenda as much as they would with uh, a large corporation. So I think also from my practical view, I would very much highlight that point, the, the neutrality and the trust that needs to Definitely. go into yeah. an ecosystem. The interesting aspect is that what we see from our research is that very often, especially in ecosystems aiming to exploitation, so earning money, you can find a startup in the middle because of the flexibility, the speed of product development, uh, maybe also the openness to, to new ideas and also the, the, ability to, or the, yeah, the ability to see chances and opportunities. And, of course, to orchestrate the ecosystem in a neutral way. On the other hand, when it comes to very explorative ecosystems, so ecosystems aiming to learning first about a new field of business and also exploring this field and creating a value proposition, um, what you can see is that very often there you have an, a big corporate in the middle as an, as an orchestrator for the very simple reason that, of course, if you just explore without without knowing at, at what time um, you can earn some money, um, you have a high uncertainty. And of course, this requires a lot of, or a strong resource base, and it requires the, the money to, to fund such an initiative, even though you don't have a return on investment um, in the first place. And this is, of course, what a startup is often lacking, this, yeah, the money and the resources just to, to explore a field for the next, whatever, two or three years, with an uncertain outcome. I think no, it's, you would hardly find an investor interesting, interested in, in investing in such a startup. Um, but again, but you can also see, even though you have big corporates in the middle of such ecosystems aiming at uh, exploration, very often they do not orchestrate the ecosystem with their normal employees, but they found own separate units they, which still have the, the advantages of the big uh, corporate um, in their back, supporting them with funds, with resources and so on. But at the same time, they have a bit like a startup atmosphere. So they are smaller. Um, you just have a few people, maybe young people, that have not been educated in the core business. Um, also, of course, different, different contracts, higher flexibility, as mentioned before. So... Even the big car corporates, they tend to, or they try to, to combine the best of two worlds, the, the strength of the big corporate, but the flexibility that you need in order to orchestrate an ecosystem. Very interesting. And now I think it definitely is time to, um, to go to some concrete examples. Mm -hmm. And I guess it would make sense since we are here at the um, Helvetia Innovation Lab, where you are working together very strongly with... Um, this uh, Swiss insurance company to um, uh, better understand ecosystems, to position themselves in an ecosystem. Um, what are some examples how um, ecosystems help Helvetia or let's say maybe an insurance company in general mm -hmm. before we also go to maybe examples from sure. other industries? Yeah. Now in the case of the insurance companies, what many com insurance companies want to do is, of course, they want to distinguish themselves from, from the competition, which 
can be done based on the insurance products or also um, finance products, such as mortgages, for example. But of course, on the other hand, it's also interesting for them to to not to distinguish themselves by not just addressing the need of a customer in terms of um, insurance, but also to look at the whole customer journey. So instead of thinking about insurance products in isolation, you think about the whole customer journey, the, cus the customer's running through in, and before he, he finally arrives at the insurance part of the customer journey. So for example, in the context of home where Helvetia is focusing on, um, you, a customer typically starts with, for example, searching property, then maybe moving in, then securing the house, insuring the house, Later on, the customer might be interested in, in a finance solution, a mortgage, for example, then searching for a property to buy, and then it's moving again, and things like this. So the insurance product is only addressing a very small step of the whole customer journey. And so, as I mentioned before, in order to distinguish itself from the competition, it's interesting for an insurance company to try to address the whole customer journey and to deliver a value proposition to the customer that goes beyond the mere insurance product. And of course, you cannot do this by yourself because you don't have competencies in whatever, searching for property or uh, moving. And this is the moment when the partners come in. So you try to collaborate with other partners in order to address the whole customer journey. And this is exactly, again, the idea of an ecosystem, that you have a value proposition that goes beyond the mere proposition or the, the, the single um, contribution of, of the individual firm, because in the end, it's not just an insurance product combined with a mortgage, combined with <clears throat> a search functionality, but it should be a new product that is combining these aspects and these elements, but is adding something on top. And again, in order, to, in order for this value proposition to come true, you need the alignment among the partners that yeah, you're collaborating with. And so, you're exactly, again, you have exactly the two aspects of, a, of a business ecosystem, the value proposition and the alignment. Okay, that has been um, an insightful example, I believe, for, for, uh, for the insurance industry with uh, Helvetia. Um, you're also looking at and you're also open to other industries, obviously. Yeah. Um, do you see uh, like best practice or next practice cases um, in other industries um, regarding a good application of ecosystems? What we see is that in almost all industries, ecosystems have gained a lot of significance and relevance. <clears throat> because with ecosystems, you can address two cases, a revenue case and a growth case, as well as a cost and resource case. So in terms of revenue growth, of course, um, given the novelty of the value proposition, also the superior value proposition that goes beyond the single contribution of the companies involved, it, yeah, you can have a competitive advantage and you can address novel markets and uh, fields of business that you have not addressed before. So this is a revenue case, which of course is relevant for all industries and all companies. So it's an, another lever, um, maybe also embedded in a growth strategy. And on the other hand, in terms of the resources, I think all industries being, for example, confronted with digitalization, which means the necessity to build up knowledge in a new field and to bring in competencies they have not used before, for example, in this case, digital technologies, um, there's a, a resource case for ecosystems. And since I believe that almost all industries are being disrupted or touched by digitalization, of course, there's a huge potential for, for ecosystems. So what I believe is, and what we see in our research, because we have cases from very different industries, is that you cannot say there's one industry that's most interesting. I think it's something that is relevant for almost all industries. And now I'd like to uh, go to the, uh, to the question about how can corporations or actors just tap into the potential of such ecosystems. And um, I would especially want you maybe to talk about how does an organization has to change their mindset or their company culture or their strategy um, in order to tap into the potential of ecosystems. That's uh, like the, the first part. And the other part also is 
maybe you can um, talk about it um, regarding again the difference between the exploitation and the exploration phase. So maybe just first, are there general shifts in, in mindset or organizational structure, for example, that need to happen, or also maybe technology aspects, of course, with APIs, etc. And then again, differences maybe between exploration and exploitation. Yeah, it's a very, especially the first part, of course, is very broad and <laughs> therefore difficult to answer for us in this state of, of our research because we have just started conducting research on business ecosystems. We see many aspects and I cannot give a comprehensive answer, but at least I can highlight some aspects. Um, one is definitely a change of mindset, as you, as you mentioned before. Um, it is a change of mindset in terms of not looking at the own company anymore, but thinking in an ecosystem, thinking about different players. So it's not about how can I create something based on the resources I am having. The question is what might be a customer demand that would be interesting to address and what are the partners I need for that. So it's a completely different way of thinking. This is the first thing. The second thing is maybe also especially for the big corporates to lose their feeling of superiority they might have because, as mentioned before, in an ecosystem, all the players are equally relevant and you are, they are mutually dependent on each other. So it would be a complete mistake to look at a startup as an inferior company that is weak, that is just an investment case. In an ecosystem perspective, or from an ecosystem perspective, it is, a, it is a very important player in this ecosystem. And you are fully dependent on it. And if you're losing that startup, then... Of course, your yeah, ecosystem breaks down, which is a problem for you, even as a very big corporate. Yeah, I think these are two, two main aspects in terms of mindset. In terms of organizational structure, of course, you have the typical problem of innovation management, because um, to some extent it might be that an ecosystem is also disrupting or cannibalizing the core business of a company. And what you typically do if, when having this problem is to distinguish the corporate and to still have one part of the company focusing on the core business and focusing on earning money. And then at the same time with a different unit, with a different mindset, with maybe different people, you try to, to build up the ecosystem and try to build up that new business based on ecosystems, which is an organizational part. So it makes a lot of sense to, to think about splitting the business in core business and ecosystem business. I am um, in, the, in the scene of fintech at least, but I think that applies in general. Uh, there's a bon mot called we need to shift from ecosystems to ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And I think that summarizes it uh, very well. Yeah. And, and again, a core business being separated from an ecosystem unit, I would say that makes sense since we heard startups with more flexibility and also a bit more neutrality yeah. are uh, better equipped to, to conduct, to orchestrate an ecosystem. And um, uh, at your um, institute here in um, St. Gallen, you not only look at ecosystems, but also other sources of innovation. Mm -hmm. Let's say uh, corporate venturing or uh, corporate incubating. And um, Maybe just briefly make a short introduction of what they are and then um, what significance does ecosystems have as a source for innovation maybe compared to these other models? How, what's the role they play for innovation? That's a very good question because the research is still in its infancy and on the other hand what we see in practice is that companies are building up ecosystems but of course, there's not that much experience and especially not experience on the impact of, of business ecosystems on innovation. So, of course, the hypothesis is that you can create a superior value proposition together with your partners and based on the alignment among the partners, which, of course, is the reason or the, final, the ultimate reason why you would like to build up an ecosystem. But, of course, no one knows whether this hypothesis comes true or not. I believe it does and I think many... in Many corporates and um, many individuals in, in, in practice and also in academia do so as well. But of course, we don't know. So it's very difficult to say what is the impact on innovation. It might be significant or it should be significant, but we still don't know. In terms of aspects such as corporate 
incubation, corporate venturing, I think they are also they can be seen as tools for building up ecosystems because many companies trying to build up ecosystems, they also have a corporate venturing and a corporate incubation initiative. And Havitz is a very nice example because on the one hand, in an ecosystem, you might involve partners based on just partnerships and contracts. You might do so based on venturing, which means investing in these companies, even you know, with a minor um, share, and then it's more about uh, venturing or maybe by just acquiring them, which is an M&A case. And of course, it's also interesting to found your own startups that, for example, you can use the orchest to orchestrate the ecosystem if you are a big corporate and you're lacking this flexibility and, and neutrality we, have, we are talking about. So incubation, venturing, also M&A, I think they are also nice building blocks, not necessary building blocks, but nice building blocks for building up, up ecosystems. So uh, again, it's it's about the interplay actually of all these different sources of of innovation. And uh, now, just in uh, in closing, I would come back a little bit again to the to the research approach that you have to ecosystems. Um, I think it's very hard to to measure uh, that, um, and I would be really eager to learn what is your take on how do you. Um, uh, measure innovation or how an ecosystem works? What, what are the kind of um, data you're using or what kind of literature are you looking at to get a better understanding? What we do, especially in the stage of research, is to use qualitative data, which means we, we take real-life industry examples from companies having built up business ecosystems, and then we conduct interviews, we um, observe these companies and we try to learn how they are building up and how they are managing their ecosystem. So it's very much about learning from companies. And since we do this not just with one individual company, but with many companies, we have a data set now of around 15 to 20 cases, um, we can compare these cases and we can also understand what are the maybe the, the boundary con conditions or the contingencies that make it favorable to, to use a certain approach for managing ecosystems and what might be yeah, or maybe what are the contingencies that make it more interesting to use a different approach. We talked about exploration versus expo exploitation. Another driving force might be uncertainty in the environment. It's also a major contingency because you have to manage an, an ecosystem differently in high uncertain environment and less uncertain environment. So um, a case study is very interesting for that and therefore we can avoid measuring innovation because the case study tries to, to answer the how and why question. How are firms doing something and why are they doing it? And it's not so much about measuring the impact of, for example, innovativeness. And, but of course, if you want to measure um, innovativeness, it's very difficult. You can use number of patents as a proxy. You can use, for example, the R&D intensity. You can use um, the share of revenues compared to the, with innovative or novel products compared to the revenues the company is, um, is creating in total. But all these approaches have their own specific flaws. I think it's a bit early to, to draw first conclusions from all that case studies that you combined. But still, um, please allow me asking, did you find um, an impact of ecosystems for, let's say, uh, revenue growth or maybe customer satisfaction? We talked about the customer journey. Um, do you see an impact already in your data or is that too early? We do see an impact. Of course, we can't measure it. But if we look at companies or, for example, also startups pursuing ecosystem strategies, they are successful with what they're doing and they're able to tap into new fields they haven't um, been in, into before and they, they are able to grow their revenues in these fields. So there is an impact for sure. Um, and I think the, the existence of these startups and these corporates using ecosystem um, initiatives in order to grow revenue and to, yeah, to tap into new fields is a very good um, proof that the ecosystem approach is working in practice and it has some, some interesting um, returns. So um, it definitely is a highly relevant um, construct, but I think that is out of discussion. <laughs> That's yeah, also absolutely. the reason why we're here. <laughs> That's why we're here. And um, 
Now, really, uh, last question from my side. Um, or oh no, I have two questions left. Um, just after this broad conversation, I always like to try to make a, a summary of main key takeaways. Um, many ideas are up in the air right now. We talked about a lot. Um, what of these topics would you like to highlight again as main takeaways? I think the key takeaway is the definition of an ecosystem because based on this definition you can understand the concept of ecosystem and you can understand what it takes to orchestrate or to yeah, to orchestrate an ecosystem or to to look at things from an ecosystem perspective and this is that the ultimate target is to have a value proposition that goes beyond the single contributions of the partners involved and in order to do so you need a strong alignment among the players involved in the ecosystem you need an orchestrator making sure that there is this, this alignment, mm -hmm. which creates a dependency, which creates therefore a risk of, of losing a partner and losing the whole ecosystem, which changes the way of doing business. It means that you have to consider all partners as very important, regardless their size and regardless your size and your strength. Um, of course, it creates a completely different value of companies because um, the company is not, or the value of the company does not represent the value of the company, but also the value of the ecosystem it is necessary for. So um, I think, yeah, based on this definition, you can just think a bit and then you will see that there are many implications that distinguish ecosystems and business ecosystems from uh, doing business in a traditional way. So for me, that's the, definitely the main takeaway. And the other aspect, if you think about the value proposition and if you think about, for example, what Helvetia is doing now, especially in ecosystem context, you are allowed or maybe even forced to think or to put the client in the center. Because now we are talking about ecosystems, but in the center, of course, there's the client. So the concept of ecosystem allows you not just to look at a single need of the client, but to look at a whole customer journey. So it's not about... Um, um, insurance for the house, for example, or insurance about the car. It's about whole housing. It's about whole mobility and the whole customer journey in these fields. So, And the ecosystem aspect, based on the partnerships with very different players, with very different knowledge, experience, and competencies, allows you to address the whole customer journey and therefore really to put the customer into the center of your, of your reasoning. I think that's a very, very good point, uh, to conclude here that the customer has to be in the center of it all. And what I would like to do um, uh, as a last uh, part in this podcast is put the listener in the center. Mm -hmm. And um, for the people who want to, to dive in in that topic a bit more and uh, gain more insights, uh, can you recommend, let's say, some insightful papers, books or other resources? That's the one part. And the other part, where can people find you if they want to learn more about your work? Yeah, of course, there are many scientific papers, but the interesting thing is that the research is still in its infancy, so you cannot find this one single paper. So there's an interesting contribution from Moore and Harvard Business Review, which is also available for, for practitioners and well-known among practitioners from 1993, which is the founding paper or the, the seed of the idea of, of ecosystems. But apart from this, there's not surprisingly little research in this field because it's such a novel uh, field. So, and of course, if I am allowed now to give a recommendation, it would be very nice if in maybe one year we have some contributions in this field. And um, hopefully they, yeah, they can give readers some insights that um, have not been published before. So this is, of course, our ultimate target. Perfect. And until then... Um short, um, let's say, uh, naming your website or something where people can uh, get a feel for, for your work? What's your website or whatever you want people to go to? Um, of course, the website is a good source of information of, of the Institute of Technology Management and, and the Chair of Innovation Management. And of course, it's, we are also very happy if people are contacting us because we are also thinking in an ecosystem from an ecosystem perspective, which means that we are always open to, to discuss with, um, with firms and uh, people from academia. So we are very much open to any contact request. 
Perfect. Um, thank you very much from my side. As a, I would call myself a conductor and orchestrator of ecosystem, and for me it has been very insightful and interesting to see um, what you are um, learning with the, um, the macro level or the, um, uh, the insights from many different case studies. So that was very uh, interesting for me as well. Thank you. And uh, with that, I would say uh, thank you very much for this great conversation and have a nice day. Thank you very much. All right, dear listeners, I hope you could collect some valuable insights from this conversation between Bernard and myself about the potential of ecosystems. If you'd like to build an ecosystem yourself, don't hesitate to contact me and I am happy to help. And don't miss the other episodes of the Sparker podcast. For example, the episode about the mindset of the unicorn investor Daniel Gutenberg or an episode about the leadership philosophy of football legend Ottmar Hitzfeld, and much more. It's definitely worth a look. You find all the episodes online on sparker.ch podcast. That is s-p-a-r-k-r dot c-h slash podcast. Or you can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and other podcast apps. And all that said... I wish you all the best and I'm happy to welcome you back for the next episode of the Sparker Podcast very soon.